just kind of start drinking um, mm-hmm. alone. And I kind of numbed out. And then I think that, you know, softened the fears. And then, you know, you'd wake up with the kind of hangover where you think you can do anything the next day and you just kind of get on that cycle. This is the Knocking Doors Down podcast featuring celebrities, experts, and everyday people who have overcome adversities, including addiction, mental health, and trauma to live purposeful lives. And that's what Knocking Doors Down is all about. Jason Carter, thanks for joining me on Knocking Doors Down. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here and I listen to the show, big fan and really honored to be here right now. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to talk about your book To Hell I Ride uh, and kind of just your, your life journey. It's uh, it's pretty fascinating because I don't know about you. Did you ever think when you thought of addict, alcoholic or something like that as the guy that was always in the dive bar, or the lady in the dive bar and, and not to be demeaning to people, but, you know, maybe a few teeth were missing and they maybe didn't have a job or they were the people underneath the overpass until you had to confront it because you're a pretty successful guy. You know, I, I did have those images. Um, there always was something to do with the teeth. I don't know why, but, uh, <laughs> and, and I think that in, in reality, I mean, I have very vivid memories of, you know, being with a buddy and I think his dad was a retired cop. If I'm uh, correct and he and his wife would just go around uh bar to bar and and kind of leave us we were in i think third or fourth grade just kind of roam the streets and so i got to see a lot of like pool halls and like daytime drinkers like real professionals you know not not the kind you know they're certainly people you know under the bridge and that's horrible but these were the kind that were retired and they were just going from bar to bar starting about 11 in the morning and wrapping it up at five, like a, like a, like a work day. Yeah. And I just remember going, that's very interesting. And this was way before we understood anything about, I guess, drinking and driving. Cause you know, we're in the back seat. <laughs> hey, this is great. And, but he was, you know, like I said, a, a total pro. It's funny that you mentioned that I hadn't really thought about it much, but definitely, you know, I grew up my, my, parents owned a trucking company and it was like the end of the day, punch the clock, you know, the beers, the whiskey and other stuff seemed to kind of fly. It was, it was like the ritualistic end of the day thing. So it seemed very normal to me as I got older that I didn't contemplate like, yeah, why, why am I going to drink at three o'clock in the afternoon? Yeah. I, I think from a very young age, it just seemed to me that was the kind of the, the flow of the day. You know, where, as I'm sure a lot of people, you know, they grew up in a a different environment. Maybe the flow of the day was dad got home and did yoga (laughs) or (laughs) made a smoothie or something. But, you know, I was raised just seeing not only my dad, but other men I admired and successful men uh, by every measure. But it was, you know, before you even under your tie you're at the bar twisting off the cap of the scotch and pouring it in with no ice to get that first one down and and i just always thought okay cool that's going to be a part of the uh, the life process right almost that we graduate to that when we get to a certain point or at least an approved graduation to it it was something to look forward to really where did you find when you first started to really you know, experiment, so to speak, with substances. What what age do you think you were? Um, you know, very, very early on, you know, just the curiosity led me to, you know, have my first beer. I believe it was a Pabst Blue Ribbon. And this was fourth grade-ish. And it just tasted bad, but undeterred because so many of the people I admired, um, including, you know, relatives and whatnot, right. That's what they were doing on New Year's Eve or Christmas lunch and whatnot. They were drinking, you know, red wine or brown water or or things like that. So I just kind of saw it as I trust them and they are making this decision and it looks fun and great. So I think that's something I need to, you know, work back towards and get to. And if you think about it, this is kind of the, I think, the strength of alcohol that's best a secret weapon, if you will, is, you know, in nature, if you 
eat something that's poisonous, you know, you die or, or it's so bitter, you never want to taste it again. But yet we as humans, we just keep going back, you know, until we <laughs> find the, the one that we really like, you know, or that we're not choking on uh, when we're guzzling it down. Oh, I've never thought of it that way, Jason. Uh, and that is true. It's, it's like, you know, can't do those beers or these ones only go with this meal or this, you know, or forget white wine. Let's stick with. Yeah, shit. I never thought of it that way. Uh, and, it's, it's, and it's demonstrated daily. You know, I have two great dogs and, you know, they, they'll eat anything that's on my plate. and They're always hovering around that if I throw down like a grape, you know, they sniff it. And they walk away. You know? <laughs> it's like even they know they're like this is not what I want. This is not what I need. You know, but with humans, it's like just keep drinking until it's until it works. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So you start experimenting at a pretty young age, but you're a determined guy. So you know, life took you on some some interesting career paths. Yeah, you know, uh, I would say that I I'm your kind of you know, normal person grew up in the suburbs, um, you know, was, was always taught that, you know, you are going to college and good grades are important. Doesn't necessarily mean I, I made great grades, but I, I just always had the vision of, you know, four years of college, graduate, go get a, you know, a job and family and that whole thing. And so I think I, that was so deeply rooted into my wiring that really wasn't going to get i guess uh taken off track sure. uh i never really thought of any alternative um and and i really think that what i felt i was doing was very normal you know all of everybody i knew you know we were all drinking a lot um everything kind of revolved around the keg you know, so to speak. And then in college, it was fraternities and, and, you know, how that goes, everything's kind of centered around the, the football game and the, the tailgate. And, you know, you're surrounded by loving and supportive people that don't really mind when you're throwing up all over the kitchen. Uh, sometimes it's actually, you know, cheered on and, and yeah. talked about uh, like it's a legend or something. So, it, it it was something that I came to understand on my own that I, I really like this way too much, you know. Let's talk then post college where you end up career wise because uh, I mean you were you, you know from the outwardly you know and I mean success is defined in so many interesting ways especially in our culture right but from appearance you were pretty successful. Um, I mean. Paying the bills and, and whatnot, I, I, I took a different career path than most of my friends. You know, I, I wanted to be in advertising. I wanted to be like on Madison Avenue and writing ads. And, you know, part of that dream was, you know, the three martini lunch and the gray flannel suits in New York City. So, you know, it was always something, you know, to do with, you know, writing or being creative. And I think I identified with that type of work especially because i think drinking was such a big part of it you know that was the legend of you know the advertising guys or the movie guys um you know it wasn't selling insurance or something it, it seemed exciting and you know i really realized probably really early on especially in new york city that i was pretty ill-equipped you know i i had a a big dream when I moved out there and, you know, most people had been there for a while or they knew a lot of people and they really were very well prepared. And, you know, I went there without a job and was knocking on doors and, and that's where I got a sense of just being lonely for the first time, hmm. you know, the irony of, you know, being in New York, but, you know, all my really good buddies were, you know, back in Texas or maybe moved up to Michigan or something. And they had stable jobs, you know, selling pharmaceuticals or, or doing something. And I just became so uh, really envious, you know, I, you know, chasing this creative dream is one thing, but you know, when it, you realize how hard it is and how, um, you know, it can change every day. And I, that's when I, you know, kind of would come back to my crappy little apartment and just kind of start, 
drinking um, mm-hmm. alone and I kind of numbed out. And then I think that, you know, softened the fears. And then, you know, you'd wake up with the kind of hangover where you think you can do anything the next day and you just kind of get on that cycle. Uh, all too familiar, Jason, all too <laughs> familiar. Uh- <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's just that delusion, that delusional hangover. Um, um, but then after, you know, I was in New York for just about a year. And during that time, my dad, who had a, a pretty complicated relationship with, he passed away. And so I was pulled out of New York um, and my brother and I went to out to California where he lived and kind of cleaned out his house and all that. And it gave me a perspective of, you know, the West Coast again and how beautiful it was. And I went back to New York just knowing I had to get out of there. And so I, I set my sights west on uh, an even more far-fetched dream of <laughs> writing screenplays in Los Angeles. And so got into this UCLA screenwriting program and and just, you know, for about three or four years was just writing and, you know, blowing through my savings and trying to get things sold. Got oh so close, you know, with an option that a producer picked up. And I just thought, oh my God, it's all coming true. And this guy, you know, just disappears after about a month. I don't even know if he's a real producer. And um, and then I was lucky to have, the, you know, the woman that I'm married to now was my girlfriend and she was up in San Francisco. And, you know, we were both just trying to figure it out. And then, uh, you know, all of a sudden it was, you know what? I really want to marry this person. And I do want to settle down and I do want to kind of get that job and the house and the mortgage and all that. And so we got married and relocated back to Texas where we're both from and, you know, just started building our life, which was remarkably fulfilling. An interesting thing you said there, you did a fractured, kind of a fractured relationship with your dad um, uh, to not make assumptions. I'm going to assume maybe there's something with your parents too, their tumultuous relationship or divorce or something <clears throat> in there. Um, yeah. It, it, it goes through in, in pretty good detail in the book, but I was in third grade and my parents got a divorce and my uh, dad stayed in California. Um, it, I ended up in Texas. My mom remarried. And so uh, I, the, the issues that I had with my dad were I, I wasn't able to actually verbalize them or even uh, think about them the right way until way after he passed. But I think it's something that every kid of divorce goes through is that the foundation that you're supposed to trust more than anything is probably the family of, of, of origin. And once that cracks, then I think it's hard for a child or kid or whatever to, to trust anything to hold together again. And I think, and where I was with my dad, I, man, I idolized and I started thinking, well, I mean, if my own father doesn't want to come to Little League game or he chooses to stay in California rather than be a part of my life, then what kind of piece of garbage am I, you know? Um, So that was, I don't think I really had that pinned down as I was going through my adolescence, but, you know, looking back, it's easy to see that drove a lot of my self-destructive behavior. Sure. I, again, I think so many people that are, that are listening can relate to that. And I know I can, you know, some of that, those, you know, there's, there's, they say the big T or the little T of trauma. And it's like trauma is trauma. You know, uh, some of us, it's, it's evil, nefarious things. And some of us, it's the unfortunate life circumstances that kind of play out. Yeah. And the psychological ones are harder to identify, you know, um, mm-hmm you can have a traumatic physical experience and then be afraid of heights. You know, maybe you fell off a table or something while you were drunk. No, um, (laughs) (laughs) probably I don't remember. (laughs) Right. Oh, that was a great wedding. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But the psychological ones are are tricky. And, you know, I think that not only are they hard to identify, but, but really hard to, I guess, fix in a psychological sense. And, it really didn't hit me until I had my own kids where, mm-hmm. I mean, as soon as I saw my firstborn, I was just like, I don't care what happens. 
if somehow my own marriage goes sideways, I, you know, I am going to be a part of this person's life, like no matter what. And instead of being really upset, you know, with my dad, of course, he's passed away. We can never talk about this. I just, I've had come to the point recently over the last couple of years where I, you know, more compassionate, just like, you know, he didn't know fully well what the hell he was doing. And, you know, he had his own struggles and, you know, later on some Vietnam on top of all that. And and you've got a pretty hot soup and, and I don't think anybody was ever talking to him about it. And this was certainly before, you know, healing and therapy, especially for men became more mainstream and accepted. And so I think he was always trying to just, you know, bite down and be tough. And I think that led to why he probably over-medicated with alcohol uh, mm. to a certain degree. Yeah. And I'm glad that you, you bring that up. You know, I know that uh, discussions I've had with people or, or shares or one-on-ones with, with some people in, in recovery is, you know, about that compassion for our parents, because, you know, think back if you are able to know anything about your family is like, okay, really emotionally immature, pretty emotionally immature. Ooh, me in a society where men, we can start addressing our emotions. We can share our emotions. It's actually strength, not vulner or weakness uh, to be vulnerable. So it, you know, kind of that evolution and self-examination is, is a necessary part of the process. I think in life in general, let alone those going through recovery. Yeah, I really, you know, you really just made a great point that, you know, when, once you become Mm self-aware and, you know, not only does it take a a lot of courage to really look in that mirror and, and rate yourself, honestly, (laughs) but once you grade out, you have a lot of work, you realize how much work there is to do. And so, you know, sometimes it's easier just to give yourself a strong B plus and, you know, move on down the road. (laughs) But, you know, I think that, um, you know, I've always been a very introspective and pretty contemplative guy. And, you know, the, the, the push and pull of me wanting to do great things, whether, you know, career wise or family wise, it was just being pulled down by you know my 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 love of alcohol you know and it, it you know like you said earlier just because you're not living under a bridge doesn't mean you don't have a a problem that's just as bad and you know when you're waking up nearly every day uh, with a just a, a heroic hangover and all you're thinking about is you know you're still going to work you're you're, you're busting your hump you're doing a good job you're not gonna let people down but you know, you, you mentioned you played basketball earlier. Imagine sure. having to go, you know, play a game and you, you don't want to lay me down, but you're also really hungover, you know, and you just have to put that much more effort into doing the basics. And, you know, that makes it hard to really master anything when you're still so focused on just getting through the day and, you know, in, in kind of in one piece and then you know, that reward is the first drink at five 30, you know, that just, just makes it all go away. And then you kind of forget how much you hate, how much you hate yourself, or how, how disappointed you are and the day's performance. Yeah. Uh, when it came to writing your book to hell, I ride, um, what point do you kind of self-identify looking back? That was the, I, some of us call it a God shot, or maybe we get that spiritual awakening that does it for us. What, what for you really inspired you to just take that inner inventory and look at yourself as, Hey, I've got a problem. You know, I, I never was one of the, the people that didn't think I was um, without a problem, you know, mm. I, the way I drank, but I, I just kept kicking the can down the road, you know, negotiating with myself and, you know, probably my wife a number of times who was really getting uh, impatient with it. And, you know, the book itself is, it is me taking that inventory. And what happened is I was so kind of exhausted at the end of my rope and we just happened to drive up 
to Telluride. And that's kind of a play on the words on the book. And once I got there, I had been sitting there in the car for 17 hours, just trying to answer the question for myself, you know, how did it come to this? How did I put alcohol above everything else, you know, and including my kids. I mean, these are really hard things to admit to yourself, you know, because I, you know, I would, I was, I am a great father. I was, but I was, I was trying so hard, but in the back of my mind, you know, I was just like, well, when, when are they going to go to sleep so I can really get to business, you know? So at, at some point you just can't do that anymore. You know, um, you're, you're just too exhausted. And while I was up in the mountains, I, you know, just with all of my heart, believe that this happened. And I wrote about it in there in the book, but God just came down to me because I was about to go get another drink and I hadn't had a drink in about six days and I felt fine. You know how it is. You're, yeah. Oh yeah. Fine. I've got this thing. Yeah. And, and I just started going through the thought of, am I really going to crank up the machinery again to get this thing, you know, and, and I just was lost. And, and I just kept hearing this voice telling me that, you know, you just don't have to do this anymore. Hmm. You just don't have to do this anymore. And it, nothing had ever made more sense to me. It was just, it wasn't, you know, if you do this, your whole or person or, you know, just do it this one time. I mean, I've heard everything, but for some spiritual being to finally just kind of grab me and say, you don't have to do this anymore. And then the logic of that just makes perfect sense. It's like, I really don't. I mean, I don't, nobody's pointing a gun in my head and telling me to go get a glass of wine, you know? Mm -hmm. And it just, from that moment, the craving for alcohol is gone. It, it, wow. You know, that was nearly seven years ago. And, you know, I, I've I haven't had a white knuckle moment. I haven't, you know, ever even, I can't imagine under any circumstance, you know, ever having a drink again. And, and I've quit before one other time for about nine months, but I did that under different circumstances. It was more of a, you know, oh, I'm in trouble. I better quit. And I was miserable. You know, I, you know, I kind of figure out how to live life without alcohol is running marathons and, you know, all these other things. But I was just counting down the time. Like, well, I know at some point, you know, I'm going to yeah. drink again. So just, you know, keep this up. But, it, you know, that experience in Colorado, it, it, you know, of course, it changed me forever. And I didn't know how to really communicated you know I, i'm not the type of person that's like hey everybody i quit drinking and god <laughs> god came down and talked to me <laughs> and uh, but I, I i didn't even talk about it for months you know everyone knew i stopped but didn't really understand it and i think the book you know i was motivated to write it one i wanted to understand it my for myself and I had this other kind of, you know, vision uh, of sorts. And it, there was a, a guy that approached me with his family and he just kind of looked real meek and um, I guess grateful and asked me if my name was Jason Carter. And I was like, uh, yeah. And he said that, you know, this is points to his kids. He's like, this is the guy that wrote the book, you know, that ended up saving my life and I didn't know how it was going to turn out or, or to look but I just thought you know there's too many people like me that might just need to hear the right story at the right time sure. to give them you know some hope and and also to know they're not alone yeah well yeah I mean it was, I don't know if you've heard this saying, I've certainly repeated it here, but people think the opposite of addiction is sobriety. It's not, it's connectivity. And when we can actually start to engage, connect and see the value we bring to others, it's like, wow, okay, I get what this recovery thing is about. You know, I've, I've been, I've never really felt comfortable with the term recovery. I, I like hmm. discovery. I mean, I'm in discovery, I like <laughs> you know, because I mean, 
at the end of the day, you're 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 rewiring every part of your life. You are you're you know six and a half years old, eight years old, nine years old. You're having to learn what's fun again. You know what what do you do with your time? And I you know your point about the connection piece is is so meaningful. And what I found naturally is that it, it, look people drink. I don't mind. I don't care. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not judging. I don't, you know, one glass of wine, 10, do what you want, but you're making a choice to disconnect. Mm. Once you do that, like you're just basically saying I'm disconnecting and that's cool. Maybe you just need to do that, but it's impossible to really create a real connection when, you know, you're, you're lubricated, you know? Um, and so uh, interestingly enough, you know, my kids were just the only ones I really started hanging out with because it was like, we aren't drinking and we're kind of on the same wavelength. And, and it was just so amazing. And I always thought that I was a, a great dad, you know, as when I was drinking, but it, you know, I, I wasn't, you know, I just, I don't think I was because I, I wasn't really there. You know, um, you know, I was at, at a ball game, but I had a, you know, 20 ounce scotch and soda in my Slurpee cup, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm cheering. But at the same time, I'm like, oh, my gosh, the ice is running out. It's really hot. How am I going to get more? I hope this game is over soon. So, um, yeah, I, I think that the the connection piece is is the best part of it. And it's also the hardest because. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult, maybe even for men, especially to have a really good conversation because most of the conversations I had, and I've had millions of great conversations, but it was over a 12 pack, you know, Uh and, you know, we're laughing and, oh my gosh, that was so great. And, and that's a real moment, but it, it pales in comparison to when you're talking to a buddy or even a stranger could be the barista at Starbucks and you actually have a meaningful moment. Um, and, th- and that actually can carry you through the day just based on that conversation or how this person made you feel or how you made that person feel just by being there and being present. No, uh, that's really, thank you for bringing that up. Mentioning it gave me a little bit of chills because I think where we're at right now, especially with what the world's been through, let alone our United States culture, we won't get off into politics. It's one thing I don't do because I get too pissed off. Um, but, but like that ability to just like have a nice, gracious moment with someone, be it someone, you know, or a stranger. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's incredibly powerful. And I'm, I'm completely Ad lib, no, I'm ad libbing and I'm poaching, and I, I was just listening to a podcast the other day on on the road, and I, it was Maya Angelou who said that you'll never remember what people do, you'll never remember what people say, but you'll always remember how they make you feel. Yeah, and you know that that really is something to just consider. You know, we all have good days, bad days, but you kind of, it's like, you know, like working out, you know, if you, when you're walking into the gas station and you see the attendant that is always on their phone and takes forever and you're already getting all <laughs> grind it up. It's amazing what happens when you just go, oh my gosh, who are you talking to? You know, is that your daughter or something? And they're just, they, they, the way they loosen up and they're that you can just see the stress like is removed from them. And, huh. and then you kind of have a thing, you know, if, whether you're buying a pack of cigarettes or whatever, but it's, you know, we all have that choice to enter a moment and either bring a version of our best self or not. I'm, I'm interested in, you know, because I have a lineage of addiction and, you know, I remember my dad going to treatment stuff, but there was no work for the house afterwards. What was kind of like for you and the missus and the kids, the work afterwards when, you know, you had this awakening for a lack of a better words and a desire for discovery? Um, yeah, th- it, it has been, I will say, uh, beautiful and and challenging 
And, uh, you know, when you, when you go it alone, um, and, and there, there was a, you know, an AA history context for me in that my dad went, he had tried to quit drinking numerous times and each time, you know, went down that. And then he would kind of push things on me. You know, it was, it just, I, the context that I had for that was, I think that's great, but I'm just going to try it this way. And I, again, I think, it's wonderful. I think that I have one of my best friends I grew up with, you know, program I'm supportive. And what I think that I've missed is the, the fellowship um, and the, the understanding because it, whereas I'm, you know, many times I find myself uh, alone on a Friday night while everybody else is out doing something. And, um, you know, I'm scrolling through Netflix and, washing my dog and it took me a while but i i got to the point where i was like you know what this is this is what i'm supposed to be doing you know this is this is a, a zen moment you know i mean there's the world spinning there's a billion people on it and i'm having a quiet moment with my dog and it's pretty awesome and it, it's again that that discovery thing it's like you know what really makes you uh want to connect and i think that without a support group it, I, there's a, a certain a void uh that i'm still trying to fill i think um sure. by not having like you know your four or five people that you could call at any time and just be like you know you're not gonna believe this um and and that, that, that i think that's just something though where it it takes time you know you're 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 trying to you know, meet new people, try new things. Uh, and, and there's no other way about it. It just, I think it's just a, a slow moving river, um, but it's, it's deep and it's strong and you feel safe, you know, when you're in the middle of it. And um, I think that's, I, I don't know. I, I feel like I'm now I'm kind of like <laughs> going off on a tangent somewhere. I love tangents. Tangents are good. Yeah. No, no I, I, I'm just, you know, cause it's, there's so many different paths, you know, I think sometimes people, um, I, I like 12 steps works for me. I think the world would benefit if there was just like a 12 step program in like high school, just really like, here it is guys, this is what it's about. This is kind of what you can gain. And, you know, like inventory, I think is so valuable. I'm actually due for another to, okay. You know, very rigorous and honest inventory here. Um, just as something I do when I get feeling a little off, you know, like, why am I off? Like life isn't, yeah, there's hard stuff right now, but it's not like terrible, you know? But uh, so it's just interesting how everyone kind of has a bit of a different, different path to it. And I, I don't think anyone should get stuck to this is the, <laughs> you know, what is it? The Mandalorian show on I'm a star Wars guy. This is the way No, yeah. <laughs> with recovery. There's a lot of ways there really is. Well, Interestingly enough, I was having a, a just a, a really, you know, friendly debate, not even really debate, just a conversation, both of us just as curious as about the other. And, you know, as I, when I was explaining a lot of the things that I've done, uh, there was their reaction was like, you know, you, you are just you're doing the 12 steps, you know, you're taking inventory, you've, you, you know, you've given into the higher power, you know maybe I haven't, you know, made amends or something, but I, I really felt like I, I don't know, I didn't have a lot to really apologize for. I'm sure that's like a horrible thing and I need to, but you know, I, I just was like, I mean, I have, I think, I think that's where you're right. I mean, the steps are important and I think that there's, you know, a hybrid version that I've kind of like found myself in and, probably at some point we'll start digging a little deeper in other ones because I, I, you know, with sobriety comes the constant, not need, but the, the constant reality that you're just, you're getting better every day and you want to improve. So uh, if you're, you know, working out and you start plat hitting your plateau, you know, what do you do? Well, you, you go online, you look for a new workout or, diet or whatnot so you're doing the 12 steps is the first 
I guess, step. And then you're right. It's that re going through them, the re inventory and, and you're, I, you really, it was great. It's great talking to you because I, I think everybody feels a little off right now. Um, mm. There, there, there's just, you know, like, I don't want to get in this political thing either, but it's like, everybody is just soundbite and they hate each other, you know, yeah. I mean, or it's almost like, you know, you're wearing a Lakers hat. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, that when we start identifying pe- people by, you know, what they may or may not have said or the kind of hat they're wearing, you know, that that's not the direction we need to be going in. And we're all just so overwhelmed with our own lives and nonstop technology and 24 hours uh, work days and whatnot that well, it's hard to find the time to think in terms of how can I connect to this person rather than how can I correct this person. I'm glad you mentioned that. So it isn't just me and this person that I was talking to, but um, I was like, are, are we in like a bizarro world? I, I make way too many like sci-fi and comic book references, but it just had that feeling like, like when did this weird shift come to like how we view and see people and you know we're inundated and if you slightly have a different opinion like you know damn that person forever it's like like bob i grew up with you i just i just disagree with you on this you know it's just my life you can do that i'm not gonna do you know that's it's gotten really freaking weird um and, but, and and maybe guys like you and me are a little more in tune with it because you know we don't have the benefit of numbing out you know with a bottle of whiskey or something so it's you know maybe and maybe the people that are getting so worked up you know the next day they don't really remember it um but i I agree there's just there there's such a lack of um i guess when you start seeing how many people don't have anybody else's best interest in mind except their own Mm -hmm. it's so obvious and Unfortunately, it's just so widespread. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's there's a pandemic we could talk about. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so, what what point really did you decide? Because um, the book came out uh, beginning of this year, right? Yeah, um, beginning of this year. So, I, 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 I'm just, you're about to finish your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. Uh, so, you know, when is, when do you sit and go? Okay, I'm going to write a book, which I love the uh the title to hell i ride interestingly enough on your way to tell your ride that you put that thing i'm like that's a good play on it that's clever stuff right there yeah but, no it's actually like a, a little part of the the town history uh oh i didn't know that. like back in the 1800s when it was like a mining town it was really wild and boisterous and so when i guess gold settlers were coming west they would run into the, uh, I guess, I don't know, heavily Christian people warning them not to go there and they would ignore them. And then they would like yell at them. Well, to hell you ride, you know, <laughs> to hell you ride. And so it just made perfect sense that that little snippet of history worked out, but, you know, deciding to write the book was, it was a, a tough one because, you know, as a, you know, writer, that that does corporate stuff, you know, I, I know how hard it is, you know, and I knew it would take a lot of time and, uh, and be a grind, especially because I would really be going through uh, these emotions, you know, that I haven't touched on in, in decades. And I was, I did, I underestimated how hard it would be, especially going through, you know, the childhood stuff. Um, but it was actually as, as powerful as any therapy I've ever gone through. And I haven't done a ton of it, but I just, you know, getting a full understanding of who you were at a certain time and what was going on and why you made a decision that you did, you know, it's, it gives you, you're, you're taking accountability for your actions and, ownership of your life and and i think that the other part of it that is so hard of looking back you know because nobody really likes what they see you know they don't want to 
they don't want to be reminded of that, you know, time they wrecked the buffet at the country club, or something, you know. But and so a part of my uh, mission was, well, I'll just do this, and it's a template, so others don't have to. Um, yeah. And and I really, uh, you know, I. I would say leverage um, leverage humor because I, I, that's the way I see the world. I mean, I, I grew up and I preferred to see Animal House over Aliens. You know what I mean? Right. And so it's 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 a, it kind of softens the lens, so to speak. Um, you know, not not some madcap comedy, but y- y- you have the choice on how you want to like uh, view things and what narrative you want to put on it. So. I just thought, you know what, there's, it's, it could be depressing enough. We've all seen leaving Las Vegas, you know, but this is, um, you know, a version that might have a little more um, of the hangover in it and a little more boyhood in it. And um, something that's highly relatable, which is, which I've been really fortunate to hear a lot of people from a lot of different walks of life, just say it's so relatable, not only, you know, to people that might, be dealing with a, a drinking problem, but the way they're able to see others that might be struggling and go, Oh, okay. There's probably a little more to this than we know. Yeah, no, that's incredibly valuable and excellent Beverly Hills cop reference right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I just, you know, we, He's in California. He's he's gonna get this. Yeah. <laughs> I spent way too much time watching movies as a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, now movies are a, a huge part of my life, and and I lovingly reference them in the book throughout, um, namely as you know a timestamp because it's a linear story. Basically, I go back to about fifth or five years old and go through about thirty instances in my life where, you know, alcohol started weaving in and out of it and where it finally, you know, got a complete hold of me. I, you know what, I, I, if I ever wrote my book, that would probably be movies and music would be very useful to, to include in there. Uh, you yeah. Know, I grew uh, up in the middle of like nowhere. So uh, movies and music and comic books were, uh, were kind of my friend. So uh, but uh, really fascinating. I'm glad you wrote the book. And, and thank you earlier for sharing that story of the, the guy that brought his family up. So this book, you know, changed my life. That's why we, we share these things. That's why we, you know, do a podcast, write a book, uh, share it a speaker, I mean, whatever it is, you know, recover out loud. Like, you know, maybe we get that one spark of connection. And that's all it takes to help someone on a better path. I, I could agree more. And what I loved about, you know, when I was, reading about your show you know the the stigma um associated with you know recovery or addiction and you know i i i'm pretty confident that it's going to turn so much in the next decade or so i mean the stigma should just be wait you're still drinking you <laughs> know like <laughs> when people come up and ask you know well why'd you stop drinking uh, i just kind of want to say well why do you continue you know what's there's a little i don't know i'm, I'm i don't think it'll ever be the main thing uh you know i have kids now that are you know the high school and college age and you know i'm not telling them anything that i i just wouldn't share to be open honest but they're you know they're going to keg parties and i know how it goes and the only way i really can influence them is just by being honest and you know i i just kind of tell them, I'm like, look, I mean, alcohol is great. You know, it's fun doing this and that, but, you know, just, you got to check in with yourself. If, if you find yourself having four beers and then you realize that you would kill everybody in this room to get your hands on a fifth, yeah. eh, you know, it's, that's a little sign that you, yeah. you, your cellular structures uh, loves this stuff too much. Yeah. I mean, con- continuing with a lot of, uh, Dangerous, potentially self-harming and harming to others behaviors, you know, or, uh, you know, you're, you're <laughs> yeah. a good indicator is if you look at another individual be at the beginning of the night, you go, there is no way I would ever shag that person. And then the yeah. next day you wake up finding that you did, 
Yeah, you, you might want to question a little bit yeah. of, of, of your decision making when imbibing the spirits, uh, yeah. let alone anything else for that. We're um, married? <laughs> <laughs> How did this happen? Yeah. Vegas. Uh, 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 well, the book, of course, uh, To Hell I Ride. Um, I, I love this tag. It's reminiscent of Back to the Future meets The Shining, clip by clip. I mean, what a what a good way to put a book and uh, what a great way to write a book. Oh, thank you. I, I appreciate it. And, you know, I, I I get excited. It's, you know, it's a slow roller, not the book. The book is a, a page turner, but more and more people are starting to uh, read it and reach out and 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 I just love having those conversations, you know, um, Absolutely. just as we are today. It's it's, you know, your podcast, my book. I mean, these things are what we're using as our spear, you know, to get into new conversations and meet new people. And I think that, you know, we live in this golden age of technology and communications where we there's no excuse. There's no reason why you can't have cool discussions, get new ideas and uh, meet new people and Absolutely. talk about the Lakers. <laughs> what uh, you've had some positive. Has there been anything where people have sent you comments? So, and you're like, what the, <laughs> yeah, there, there was, I, you know, on Amazon, there's reviews and, and all of them have been just really positive. And there was uh, one that was really short. It was like, you know, this guy thinks he's a one line comic and he's not funny, you know? And it was just, I was like, is this some guy that I like, I don't know, uh, you know, gave a wedgie to in like middle <laughs> school or something. It was just so out of place, out of context. But, you know, I respect everybody's opinion. And, sure. um, you know, when you put art or something out there, it's going to be interpreted um, differently. Um, but for the most part, it's, you know, five stars all the way. And, you know, the best uh, feedback I've heard from numerous people that are like, I don't even read. And I read this book in one sitting or it only took me two days or something. And, you know, going back to, you know, screenwriting and entertainment and love movies, you know, I, I, I put a premium on like, okay, I'm not going to just write this, you know, big sprawling, you know, complaining, uh, depressing novel. I, you know, I, I want to get the point across, but I, I must entertain as well. Yeah, it's a it's a good way to uh, sneak in a message, so to speak. Yeah, and and I think that you know where, it, you know, I guess the stigma associated with it is that I really don't, I don't, I mean, I don't, there's nothing in the book that's going to show somebody how to stop drinking. It's right. but it's a book that might get you um, thinking about drinking in a way you haven't before, and. You know, there's no um, evil man running around that I'm chasing that is, you know, pouring drinks down my mouth. It's really just more of a, um, a, a journey inward to see, you know, when and where King Alcohol got his hooks into you. And, and I just don't, as much as I like to think I'm unique, I know I'm not. And I know that there's a lot of really good people out there similar to me that, that probably just are looking for a, um, a story to fill their time that might give them a lift um, and make them think about things a little differently. Well, of course, if you want to know more about the book, uh, To Hell I Ride, jasoncarter.com, you can go there, pick it up, Amazon as well. Uh, Jason, how about some fun random questions? Um, yes, let's, let's do it. All right, you are stranded on a deserted island. You can take with you one movie and one music album. What are they? Oh, one music album. I will go with Tupac Shakur, Me Against the World. And the one movie I would take is Goodfellas. Oh. Which is not smart because it makes me so hungry every time I watch it. But, <laughs> but I, you know, I've seen, there's probably 20 or 30 movies I've seen 50 plus times. Midnight Run. I, I, I'm going to have to change my answer. It would be Midnight Run. Okay. You know, just entertainment and a perfectly timed movie and a De Niro and Groden at their best. Uh, pet peeves. What just irks you? Uh, People that 
text while they're having a conversation with you in person. I, I, I can't stop hating that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, yeah, that, there uh, it is. Um, and also there, I don't know if they do this in California, but there's um, a lot of people in retail restaurant or otherwise, they, they greet you as like, Hey boss, Hey boss, you know, that's what they say. And, and I, I find that very disarming. I don't know <laughs> why. Um, I, I think, I don't know if they're being snide. I don't know if it's some bigger statement about socioeconomic, you know, inequality or something, but I, I'm like, it bothers me, you know, <laughs> um, just uh, hello is fine. Yeah. So, but, but Hi. I would have to write the texting. Yeah. Hey, welcome to Starbucks. Not, right. Hey boss. How about a welcome aboard? That'd be nice. You know, welcome <laughs> aboard. Come on in. All right. Yeah, right. How's uh, the t- weather out there? Let me ask you if this ranks. So my kids have a tendency because they're uh, 13, 12 going on uh, 25 and 26, but they like to come up when I'm in the middle of texting or sending a message. Does that also fall in that? Because ha- I've had to go, hold on a second. Let me finish this. It, it, it's not as often to become a, a pet peeve, I guess. Um, we're, and I, I have a 13 year old daughter. Do you have boys or girls or both? Uh, oldest is son. Uh, the youngest is daughter. Okay. Yeah. They're at that, just that great age where, um, you know, they, they want that attention, but they also, I think know better because they have the technology too. So <laughs> they, maybe there's like, they're doing something else. Like, okay, I know how to get dad. Let's, Get him while he's sending that text. <laughs> All right, Dad, can I go? Whatever. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, I, I, I think that it, it's, it's so common, you know, and, and I'm, I'm not perfect. You know, I, I have a addictive personality and whatnot. So I, I can read on my phone a lot and I can read on it while I'm watching movies and whatnot. But I recently bought these. Um, I'm going to show you these. Yeah. Apple AirPod Max headphones because um, the, I, the the sound canceling ones and the Bose just I you know they're good but they weren't good enough for me as much as I'm working out at home and these also hook up to your Apple TV if you happen to have that as your streaming portal and I got to tell you watching movies with those on it, it has reminded me how much I love movies because we've gotten so used to you know, watching at home, but that doesn't mean people aren't just going to walk in front of the TV or ask you to do something. But when you have these on, all of a sudden you're like in George Lucas's basement. I'm like, well, I'm rewatching movies just so I can like hear them, like watching Terminator 2, you know, the LA River scene again with those on. It's incredible. I might have to look into that. I, I had one of the coolest experiences that brought me back to the emotions I had as a kid. I took my girlfriend, uh, we took the kids and I, and one of my best friends, his girlfriend, and we went and saw the original Star Wars with a live symphony. And I hadn't had that moment where I remember being five, six years old, breathing in the trench run with Luke and filling it, but with a live symphony playing that music, I got to tell you, Jason, holy shit. It That's was incredible. Like, it was like, whoa, the... The, the goosebumps, the everything, I forgot there was anywhere one else around. It was one of those magical things. So I, I'm with you. I love movies, still love go, going to the theater, you know, uh, overpriced popcorn, whatever. It puts you back in that wonderful, like for me, a happy place. You know? It's really cool. Yeah, I, I saw Star Wars, uh, I think, 13 times in the theater when it came out. I think I, like I was in second grade, maybe, maybe first. I don't know. But what I mean, I think that's what ultimately you know, pulled me to Los Angeles is just wanting to be a part of that movie making process. And it, 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 there's, those are so well done. And, you know, it's, it's rare that you walk out of a movie theater and you're just, you know, kind of holding your heart and you can't believe it. You're thinking about it for, you know, weeks. And, um, and, and I think that as much as I love the home kind of theater and the convenience of it all, man, you could be watching Citizen Kane and it's not going to feel like a great movie because you're just, you know, you're supposed to be in a dark theater and you're supposed to be just focused on that. And um, I think as much as 
phones have brought us great convenience in life and safety and whatnot. It's also, they've also taken a big part of our life away. I agree. I agree. Uh, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? Time travel. I don't know if that's a superpower. That sure. would be a good one that might cause too much, you know, damage, but I, you know, I think, I think fly, you know, you gotta be able to, to fly. I think that would be the ultimate, um, especially in LA. Uh, <laughs> you know, like, oh, I'm sorry. The, uh, the 405 is closed this morning and it's like, uh, no problem. I'll be there in three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Long beach. No problem. No problem. Um, yeah, hopefully uh, the yeah. whole family can for a good beach day. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, if you can fly, I think you could probably carry the picnic basket and, you know, leash the umbrella. I don't know if you could actually carry others, but um, I don't know. That that would that would definitely be it. I think of all the all the Marvel stuff, um, I still go back to Superman as the the cool guy. I mean, even though they don't really portray him that way anymore. Uh, one last random question, Jason. Um, this either goes really north and awesome or really south. Uh, if you could have dinner with any one person, living or not, who would it be? You know, I would go with Oprah Winfrey, <clears throat> huh. namely because I think she one is just incredible. But I think she's the one person that has gotten you know that big that powerful that influential that she would still have a very connective dinner or breakfast or lunch with you and just seems like the real deal you know have, have listened to you know tons of stuff that you know there's part of me to be like oh michael jordan or you know phil jackson or something but i i just don't think they would want to be having dinner with me i think that <laughs> um i think somebody like you know Oprah, whose whole life has, you know, she has used trauma to transform herself into this person that is sharing information and bringing out the best in others and made it her life's work. I just think that would be a very phenomenal dinner. And she's met every other person on earth who I'd want to have dinner with. So I could, you know, pull her for some gossip. Jason, I like to leave the guests with the, the last words. Um, from whatever perspective you want to share, maybe about your life or about the book encompassing, um, what, what might that be? Um, that is a lot of pressure. No, <laughs> uh, I, I would say that curiosity is the new superpower. And, you know, if you find yourself um, in a place um, where your life has gotten sideways or, you know, things aren't working out, you know, just get curious because, you know, there's, there's things out there, there's people out there, there's new ways of doing things out there that could probably get you out of that place. But as soon as you think you've got it all figured out, then I don't know, it becomes a lot more difficult. Um, and I think that, you know, wanting to learn, you know, the gift of wanting to continue to read books or, uh, listen to podcasts or, you know, listen to a different type of album even is, is a great thing to do. And everybody is born and having that choice to do so. 